verses. Colossians chapter 1, starting to read at verse 21. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that, ha that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Lord, thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, that through it we would learn who you are and what you've done and that we in turn would respond. Open our hearts, Lord, to what you want to say to us this morning. Lord, please give me the strength to do this. And take this time, it's yours. Do whatever you like with it. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've been working through, as I said before, the Apostles' Creed. An ancient creed from the early centuries of the Christian church. And we want to look at just what does it mean? What does it mean to us today? And what does it teach us about our faith and what we really believe? And last week we looked at the person of Jesus Christ. We looked at who he is. What are his characteristics? And this week, we want to move from who he is to what he does. We want to focus on the work of Christ and what our response should be to that work. We want to look at the line, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. Now, the work of Christ that matters to us the most today centers around the cross. It's the main symbol of Christianity. We sit up on the roof of our church. People wear it around their neck in jewelry. And there's nothing like it in any other religion. Nowhere else is, do we have the idea of God becoming human and, and lowering himself to die on a cross to, for the sins of humanity. Some religions would consider that an affront to God's holiness, that he would stoop so low to do that. Some religions focus more on works. They wouldn't even consider the cross important because it's all about our effort and our works and the things we do. And if we do more good things than bad things, then it's good. Some people, whether religious or not, don't, may not even have a concept of sin. It just doesn't enter into their, it's not even on their radar. They don't feel that there's any sin that needs to be dealt with on a cross. The cross demonstrates God's desire to save all people. Everyone. Second Peter 3 9 says, God is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but have everyone come to repentance. First Timothy 2 4 says, God our, talks about God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Jesus came to die on a cross for everyone, not just for a few. And through the cross, Jesus comes to solve four basic problems that face us, that face humanity in terms of our relationship with God. And I'm indebted to my Bible college professor, John Stevenson, for these four points that's going to provide the skeleton for what we're going to talk about this morning. The first, I'll give you the four now for starters. Humans are guilty sinners. And so Jesus is the solution for that through his sacrifice. Second, humans are the object of God's anger. And so Jesus is our propitiation a word we don't use much anymore, but we'll look at that in a minute. Third, humans are enemies of God, and so Jesus is our reconciliation. And fourth, humans are slaves to sinning, and so Jesus is our redemption. That's the skeleton. Those are the four we're going to look at. So first, Jesus is our sacrifice to save guilty sinners, which we all are. Jesus is the victim who did not need to die, who substituted for the offender who should have died. Jesus, the work of Jesus is that he is our substitute. He took our place. He died in our place. We are the ones that should have died. When I was in university at Concordia in Montreal, we used to do this, the Christian Fellowship used to do this book table where we would, ostensibly was to sell books, but in reality it was just an excuse to sit there and talk to people as they went through the main lobby of the university. And we had a lot of good conversations. I remember one guy coming up to to us, and he was so frustrated because we had, I guess someone had said something to him, and he said, you Christians, you always talk in analogies. You're always using analogies. It's so annoying. But I was reading a book this week, a theology book, that talked about 
the, the beauty of analogies, that God has given us these, the ability to make these powerful analogies because spiritual truth is sometimes hard for our human minds to wrap around. So we have to kind of tell the story in a way that fits our paradigm so that we can understand it. And so one of the favorite analogies I have when it comes to talking about um, what Jesus has done for us is that imagine a courtroom. The judge is sitting up way up high on his bench. He's got the robe on. Think back 20, 30 years ago in Ontario. He's got maybe a wig on. He looks very imposing. And there's somebody sitting in the, the, the suspect's bench over there. And, and the co- trial has gone on, and it's an open and shut case. He's been found guilty of capital murder. Okay, We don't have this in Canada anymore, but imagine this is a capital crime. He has murdered people first degree. There's, there's no question about it. Even his lawyer thinks he's guilty. And so, you know, the, the judge has taken all the evidence and he's ready to hand down the sentence. And he's ready to pound the gavel and he says to the, the accused, do you have any final words? And the accused just starts reaming on everybody and swearing and screaming and said, you're, you're just, I hate you all. You're all terrible and, and just no remorse at all. And, and the judge is sitting there, um, as the judge hearing all this, and realizing that he's against this person, but also is heartbreaking because that person's his son. And so he sits there with the gavel, and he's heard all the evidence, and he's ready to proclaim the, the verdict. And he pounds the gavel down, and you are sentenced. This court finds you guilty of first-degree murder, capital offense, and you are sentenced to death. He bangs the gavel down, and it's done. Then the judge stands up and takes off his robe, takes off his wig, walks down to the accused's bench there. He opens the door, and he tells the accused, okay, go. And he steps into the box and says, I'll take the sentence. I'll take your place. See, justice has been served. The judge didn't just say, oh, you're my son. It's okay. I'll fix this. You just go. And they didn't say, okay, we'll, we'll overlook this. You go ahead. Justice was served. A penalty was pronounced and a penalty was paid. But someone else, in mercy and in love, substituted and took the person's place. That's the picture of what Jesus, what God has done for us through Jesus. The cross is where God's justice and love meet. We are pronounced guilty of sin. The penalty for good, the, the penalty God's justice calls for has been paid. God hasn't overlooked it. He hasn't just let it go. That would be unjust. He doesn't just say, you know, you know what, I'm a God of love, so you know what, Adolf, we won't worry about those six million Jews. Just come on into heaven anyway. No, a penalty has been paid, but Christ paid it in his love, in his mercy. He himself, through his only son, has paid the penalty. And Jesus knew what he was doing. We talked last week about how some people see a very confused Jesus who didn't understand what his mission was. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. He went willingly, intelligently, and consciously to the cross, and he he went as a sinless human. He didn't have his own sins to pay for. If he had sinned even once, the sacrifice would have been no good because he would have been paying for his own sin. But because he was sinless, he could be our substitute. He can take our place. The penalty has been pronounced on us, but he takes the penalty for us. Jesus is our sacrifice for us guilty sinners. Secondly, humans are the object of God's anger, and Jesus is our propitiation. Now, it's not popular to talk about an angry God. We have to see a God of love, and propitiation is a word we rarely use, but it's the idea of bringing about reconciliation with somebody by turning away anger. It's the idea of appeasing someone's anger. Now, we see images sometimes in folklore about uh, people or tribes trying to appease an angry God by making sacrifices and doing certain things. That's not the kind of thing we're looking at in terms of God. God's anger is not like our anger. God's anger is a righteous anger. He loves righteousness. He is holy. He hates sin. And he's angry at sinners, too. Psalm 11.5 says, The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. Psalm 5.5 says, The arrogant cannot stand in your presence, God, but you hate all who do wrong. 
See, sin causes anger, which creates, which causes punishment and destruction. God's love is still there. Anger and love are not mutually exclusive. God's anger is his holiness in action. In his holiness and purity, sin and sinners cannot be in his presence. Now, because it's just kind of hard to wrap our mind around, I decided to go to books written by people who are smarter than me. So John Volver says this. It's not a question of satisfying a vengeful God, but satisfying a God who is just and righteous and holy in all his dealings. Such a God, while on the one hand demanding complete satisfaction of his righteousness, is the same God who, because of his love for lost humanity, sent his Son to be that propitiation. The cross accomplishes a satisfaction of divine justice, which God accepts on behalf of the sinner. God can now pour out all his love and all of his blessings of grace. John Stott writes, God took his own loving initiative to appease his own righteous anger by burying it himself in his own son when he took our place and died for us. So as I'm reading that, my question is to myself, so God, why not just don't be angry? I mean, if you're going to pay the price for it yourself to deal with your righteous anger anyway, why just, just don't be angry? Then you don't have to go through that whole cross thing. Just, just don't be angry anymore. But that would have been against God's holy nature. God cannot contradict who he is. God is holy and God is pure and he's without a trace of sin. Sin is contrary to who he is, to his nature. And God is also just. Injustice is contrary to his nature. That's why he gets so angry when he sees injustice in the world. He can't just say, oh, I'll let this go. That would go against his perfect justice. Somebody had to pay the penalty or else it's just not fair. But he loved us so much that the only way to show his love and keep his justice was to pay the penalty himself. The cross was the expression of God's anger on the one hand and the expression of putting into action God's grace on the other. Humans are the action object of God's anger, but Jesus is our propitiation. Thirdly, humans are enemies of God, but Jesus is our reconciliation. We hear that word conciliator like two, in a labor dispute. A conciliator is someone who brings two people on opposite sides together. We hear of people who have, who have divorced and are separated and they experience a reconciliation. They put the marriage back together again. It's bringing two who are apart and angry and fighting, reconciling them back together as one. Our sin makes us an enemy of God. Humanity's relationship with God is broken because sin cannot stand in God's presence. And there's, there's nothing we can do about it, but there is something God can do about it. Colossians 1, 21, 22, which we read before, says, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. Reconciliation is at the heart and soul of what the cross of Jesus Christ is about. We went from being God's enemies to being his friends because of what Jesus did. Christ's death on the cross restores the relationship that humans were meant to have with God. Romans 5.10 says, For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? 2 Corinthians 5.18 reads, All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and gave to us the ministry of reconciliation. We're called to help other people understand that they too can be reconciled to God, that they too can have their relationship with God restored. There's nothing that we've earned. There's nothing we can do for ourselves that can make that reconciliation work. It's accomplished through Jesus' death on the cross. That restores our relationship with the Creator because the price for our sin has been paid. And fourth, humans are slaves to sinning, so Jesus is our redemption. To redeem something means to buy it back. I, I don't have TV. It's by choice. Once When those rabbit ears were gone and everything went digital, I just... That was it. No more TV. And so anything I watch has to be on DVD. I'll go to the DVD store in Oshawa every month and 
buy myself some new programs. One of my favorite shows was a show from the late 1990s, early 2000s called Touched by an Angel. And they had a story one time about slavery in Sudan, where this young boy whose mother was a senator, U.S. senator, had some documents in her briefcase about slavery in Sudan and Africa. And the child finds out about it accidentally and realizes this isn't a good thing and, and finds out you can buy slaves for like 50 bucks American and give them their freedom. So he goes to his school during show and tell and says, uh, this is a picture of so-and-so. He costs 50 bucks. He's a, he's a slave. And we can raise money to free the slaves, to redeem them, to buy their freedom. And they did. But we are, we are in our sinful nature. We too are slaves. We may not realize it, but we're slaves to sin. Slaves, we're slaves to whatever masters us. And a lot of people in the world don't agree with that. They're like, well, no one masters me. No one tells me what to do. I'm the master of my own fate. I'm in charge. But if we're slaves to selfishness, if we're slaves to what, what we want, then by default, we are slaves to sin because our human nature is prone to sinfulness. And we can't earn our redemption. We can't buy it. It's not like the kid who spent 50 bucks so that the slave in Sudan could be free. We can't buy our redemption. First Peter 1, 18, 19 says, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, <clears throat> but with the precious blood of Christ, the lamb without blemish or defect. Silver, gold, anything we do, our good works can't earn that redemption. And it talks about our empty way of life. That means pursuing things that don't last forever. All these things that we have and that we accumulate, it's all going to burn one day. Chuck Swindoll, who wrote one of the books I recommended a few weeks ago, he says there are only two things that last forever, God's world, God's word, and people. And a life not spent investing in either of those two things is a life that is wasted and empty. 1 Corinthians 7.23 says, You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of human beings. Romans 6.17-18 says, But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. When God redeems us, when, we allow, when God buys us back, our allegiance changes. We go from being slaves to sin to being slaves to righteousness. In the words of that great theologian, Bob Dylan, from his Slow Train Coming album, he said, you got to serve somebody. Or miraculously, he said, you got to serve somebody. That's what he said. It might be the devil or it might be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. We think we're masters of our own fate. But in reality, we either serve God, who is holy, who created us, who loves us, who knows us, knows everything about us and has our best interests at heart, or we serve ourselves, which by default means that we are an enemy of God and we are serving the enemy of God. The selfishness of sin or the righteousness of God, which one is going to be our Lord? It's a stark choice, and we would like to be able to choose something in the middle. Can we have choice? Can we go to door number three, please? But no. It really is one or the other. It's the reality of life. Philippians 2, 9 to 11, which we read earlier, says, Therefore God exalted Jesus to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ is Lord. That's already a reality in heaven. It's already the truth there. And it will be an acknowledged reality at the end of time when everyone, Scripture says, will bow and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. But the question is, is it a reality to you today? Is Jesus Christ not just the Lord, but is he, as it says in the Apostles' Creed, is he our Lord? Is he your Lord? When I've talked to young people over the years and and try to make, simplify it as, as much as possible and explain how it is that you, you develop a relationship with God and, and be reconciled to him. I usually try and say, you say four words to God and you mean them with all your heart. And those four, four words are, I'm sorry, take over. I'm sorry. 
It means we apologize. We, we recognize that we've done things that have hurt God, hurt ourselves, and hurt other people. And we allow God to we open up our heart, open up our minds, and we allow God to put his finger on things and say, well, I know you don't think that was necessarily wrong, but that's not the way I created you to live. And, and yeah, you really, that, that there, you know, that needs to change too. And, and we allow God to be able to point the things out that we need to say I'm sorry for. And then we repent. And repent means doing a 180, turning from sin and to God. It doesn't mean doing a 90. That's called self-help. When we turn from our bad habits and go this way, it's doing a complete turn where we're, we're leaving sin behind, our sinful habits and ways, and turning to God. It's a change of attitude. It, it, we come to a realization where I'm sorry means I'm not going to justify it anymore. I'm not going to rationalize it anymore. The words, but, 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 are going to leave our vocabulary. And we're not going to ignore it anymore and just bypass it. We come face to face with sin, which is not comfortable. But we see it for what it is. We see it for what it's done. And we see it for the, the empty life that it leads to and how it keeps us from God and how it keeps us from what he created us to be. And then I'm sorry means you change your behavior. When I was younger, I was like the teenager, I guess, maybe Victoria's age. I used to frustrate my parents so much because I was very willing to say sorry. Oh, I said sorry so many times. But then I would do the same thing again. <laughs> Mom would say, you know what? It doesn't mean anything anymore. You're just, you've, you've, ruin the word sorry for all the times you're doing that. A person is not really sorry if they say sorry and then turn around and do the same thing five minutes later. A change in behavior has to happen for I'm sorry to really work. So when we do that, when we say I'm sorry to God, God saves us by his grace through faith. Faith means we trust. We trust what Jesus did on the cross and we trust that that's enough to take care of our sin, to forgive us, to reconcile us to God. And, we, and that trust builds in us a new willingness to obey. We, we kind of trust, we trust that God is who he says he is, and we can obey him. And he breathes new life inside of us. The Gospel of John calls it being born again. Second Corinthians 5.17 talks about being a new creation. The old stuff is gone. And we begin to live a whole new life. But there are two parts to that little phrase that I, I tell young people to say to be reconciled to God. I'm sorry and take over. You know, we could usually handle the I'm sorry part. It is the take over part that sometimes can be tough. Let's go back a bit to that idea about being redeemed, that idea of being bought back from slavery, freed from the slavery of our old way of life. And that is the truth. God has freed us. We sing that song sometimes, Amazing Grace, Our Chains Are Gone. The chains of sin that used to hold us in slavery through Christ's death on the cross, they're gone. But the thing is, our old sinful nature still kind of hangs around. We're not in chains anymore, but the old sinful nature is still there, still trying to suck us back in, draw us back to make decisions that go against God. It doesn't have us in chains, but it still tries to influence us. And the more we give in, the more we turn towards it, the influence kind of grows till we start to believe that Maybe I'm back in chains again. It's kind of like, you know, I don't know too much about training dogs, so I should ask somebody who really knew, but you could train a dog, Saxon, maybe you could tell me if I'm wrong or not, but you could train a dog to not leave your property, right? You could, it's almost like there's an invisible fence in the dog's mind and it just won't leave the property. There's no fence there, there's no wall there, but he believes I just can't leave the property. And the, our sinful nature tries to do that to us, make us believe that we're stuck in this little box, that the chains are actually back on. But we need to know and understand that our chains are gone. We've been set free. And that we can begin to live who we really are. And take over means turning over the mastery of our life to God. But because we're stubborn and we try and take it back all the time and become masters of our own fate, take over is more than just a one-time thing. We don't just say to God, I'm sorry, take over. And that's important to do it once. But it's something we have to do every day. Giving God control of our lives and making him Lord every day. And when takeover becomes a lifestyle, then Jesus is not just the Lord, but then he is our Lord and he's your Lord. Now, we don't want to take, say take over to just anybody. I'm not going to walk up to some stranger in the street and say, hey, you look like a good guy. Just take over my life. Here, here are the keys to my car. Here's my apartment. No, you've got to know that you can trust the person you're saying take over to. And God is worthy. 
He did everything possible through Jesus' death on the cross to reconcile us to himself. He knows us better than we know ourselves because he created us, and he wants what's best for us. And he wants to transform us into a new creation. We're made new in Christ when we say, I'm sorry. And we live out that reality. We, we become who we already are when we say, take over. So we have a decision to make, every one of us in our lives. God's done everything he can to exercise his love and his justice together. And he did it at the cross. And the question is, what's going to be our response? For we can't just leave it there. The cross demands a response. We must respond one way or the other. Do we we ignore it? Do we hang on to ownership of our own lives and in the process remain distant from the one who loves us, from our creator? Or do we respond, God, I'm sorry. I accept the gift of God's mercy given at the cross for myself. And do we respond, God, take over. God, you own me. You have bought me. You have redeemed me. I am no longer a slave to sin. I'm no longer a slave to my own impulses. I'm no longer a slave to what the, these, these labels that the world tries to attack, attach on to me. God, take over. Be my Lord. And through your Lordship, make me Lord into the person you created me to be. So we read, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son. That's good. You believe that he existed. You believe he is fully God and fully man at the same time. You believe he is a sinless person. That's good. But that belief has got to make a difference in your life today. And the key to making a difference in your life today is, I believe in Jesus Christ, our Lord. I believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord. Would you pray with me, please? With our heads bowed and eyes closed. Maybe you're here today and you've never said either of those two little phrases. Never said I'm sorry to God or never said take over to God. And he's here. We've welcomed him here. We've opened our hearts and minds to him and he's listening. And he's already done everything possible to reconcile us to himself, to 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 fix the broken relationship through the cross. And all it takes from us is a response. Four little words. Sounds easy, isn't it? but I know in reality it's tough because to live out those four little words can be tough. But God promises to give us his spirit to help us. God, I'm sorry. God, I know there's things I've done that aren't right. I haven't been living the way you want me to, you created me to, so God, I'm sorry. If you're here today and you've never said those words to God and you want to, you can do that even now. Or take over. Maybe you have accepted Christ as your Savior long ago and he's there somewhere in your life, but he's not really Lord. He's not really in charge doesn't own you. You haven't let him own you. And that's the way we were created to live. With God in charge. And he knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows this world. He knows how to guide us through things. He wants so much to be our Lord. And like we said before, there's no real middle ground It's either you in charge of yourself or God. It's always calling us to make that commitment to say, take over. And if you've never really done that, or maybe you need to kind of refresh it today, because you know there are some areas in your life that you've been taking back for yourself, this is your opportunity, because he's here. He's ready to hear. Take a few moments, just you and God. And if you need to say, I'm sorry, or if you need to say, take over, do that in your own way. And let him breathe new life into you. Take a moment and make this personal.
You are stronger. You are stronger. Sin is broken. You have saved me. It is finished. Christ is risen. Jesus, you are Lord of all. Thank you, Lord, that you are stronger than, than anything, anything we face. You're stronger than the chains that, that have held us in sin. Thank you, Lord, that they are broken through your death on the cross and through your resurrection, you've given us life. And you are Lord, not just of all, but of me. And Lord, you know how I fall short of that so many times and how we all fall short of that so many times. And Lord, this day, we want to recommit ourselves. Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, take over. Be our Lord. Be my Lord. Be in charge. Show us what that means practically, daily. Guide our decisions, Lord. Help us to live the way you created us to live. Be our Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for what you've done on the cross and for who you are. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.